Hello, welcome to the video channel of the Society for the History of Alchemy and Chemistry. We will shortly be starting a seminar and here is Professor Frank James, the chairman of the Society, to introduce it. Thank you, Rob, and welcome to this uh, Shack uh, seminar, webinar, whatever one would like to, to call it. Um, we are recording um, uh, this session and it will then go out on the Shack YouTube channel in due course. Uh, and so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Caroline Cobbold, who is membership secretary of Shack from the University of Cambridge, and she's just published her book on uh, true colours. Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And thank you too to Rob, Anna, Becky, Joe, and all everybody in the Shack team who've enabled these online seminars to go ahead in these rather surreal times. Um, yeah, as Frank mentioned, in my talk today, um, I'm going to focus on a small aspect of the research that fed into, sorry about the phone, fed into my book, um, A Rainbow Palette, How Chemical Dyes Change the West's Relationship with food. Um, the area I'm going to look at is how chemists were urged by manufacturers, both dye manufacturers and food manufacturers, to defend the use of synthetic chemicals in food when concerns about the health effects of the chemicals, particularly aniline and azo dyes being used in food, began to surface. Um, I'm sure many of you listening are familiar with the history of how chemists such as William Perkin began to create new chemical dyes from coal tar waste for the booming 19th century textile industry. These dyes were heralded as wonders of science, leading to a new status for chemists in which the public saw chemistry capable of transforming the world converting dirty black coal tar waste into a myriad of marvellous products from dyes, drugs, flavourings to perfumes and insecticides. As we can see here from this wonderful poem from Punch, of which this is just one verse of many, oil and ointment and wax and wine and the lovely colours called aniline, you can make anything from a salve to a star, if you only know how to, from black coal tar. However, it wasn't long before concerns began to surface about the safety of the new dyes, with people complaining of rashes caused by dyed clothing. Stories and rumours persisted of the public being poisoned by the clothes they wore, a situation which was again captured in a lovely punch poem. The poisoned hat, We've heard of socks that poisoned feet, hats against heads are now combining, with poison in the four and nine, lined with the dye of aniline, death may haunt any lining. However, by the time these concerns arose in textiles, the dyes, which were actually textile dyes, were being used extensively as food colorings. And this was an era, I'm sure many will be aware, where food adulteration was already a big issue and being reported in the press, as we can see here. And chemists were being appointed by local authorities across Europe to assess the purity and safety of food. So concern around the safety of the new wonder dyes put organic chem chemists in an invidious position. On the one hand, their newfound reputation was closely linked to the creation of these chemical dyes, and on the other hand, chemists had also boosted their status during the 19th century as protectors of public health, analysing anything from river water to food. Meanwhile, food manufacturers had found that aniline and azo dyes made incredibly effective food colourants, making processed food look fresh and extending its shelf life. Consumers, too, liked their tinned peas to be green rather than brown and their butter to be the same yellow all year round. The chemical dyes were also significantly safer, it must be said, than some of the metal colourings, such as copper, lead and even arsenic, that was sometimes used by unscrupulous food producers. As the German chemist, chemist Theodor Wiel remarked, 
banning all synthetic chemical dyes in food at this stage would have been strongly resisted by food producers and legislators. Indeed, it was actually in the interest of German chemists to demonstrate the safety of the dyes, as Germany was the world's major chemical producer by far by the 1880s. When the extensive use of aniline and azo dyes in food and drink became a public concern in, during the 1880s, dye manufacturers responded defensively to media discussion of the subject. Both chemical companies and food manufacturers either denied knowledge of the use of the new dyes in food production or argued that they were harmless, especially in the small quantities used. Both sets of manufacturers, that's food and chemical, also began to use scientists to verify their claims. At the request of the dye manufacturer Badisha Anilin and Soda Fabrik, BASF, which we all know today, the well-known scientists August Wilhelm von Hoffmann and Rudolf Virchow uh, publicly vouched for the harmlessness of many of the aniline and azo dyes produced by the company. Hoffman had himself created several new dyes and had trained many of the leading chemists involved in the chemical dye industry. And Virchow was well regarded as one of Germany's leading medical scientists working on cell and cancer theories. Virchow was also a prominent politician and public health campaigner. The apparent endorsement of aniline dyes used in food by these renowned German chemists was acknowledged in an 1887 publication by the French chemist, Paul Cazeneuve, who was professor of chemistry and toxicology at the Lyon Medical Faculty in France. The publication included, included experimental and scientific evidence produced by Cazeneuve and other physiological and organic chemists purporting to show the harmlessness of aniline and azo dyes. As well as reproducing the proclamations signed by Hoffman and Virchow, the publication also included statements by Karl Grabe, at the time Professor of Chemistry at Geneva University and a consultant to BASF's French factory, as well as other notable chemists, guaranteeing the harmlessness of most chemical dyes. It is no coincidence that BASF commissioned a publication on the safety of aniline and azo dyes endorsed by high profile chemists in 1887. At precisely this juncture, governments in Germany and France were reviewing food legislation amid media concerns across Europe about the possible toxicity of the new dyes. Because of chemists inability to find accurate and standardized tests for the new dyes, and that's a whole different story, chemists realized that they needed to work closely with the food and drinks industry, as well as public authorities, in order to secure any scientific authority. However, the relationship between the chemists and the food industry was often a challenging one. In 1883, chemist Charles Girard, head of the Paris Municipal Laboratory of Chemistry, produced a report showing the prevalence of adulteration in French food and drink. Businesses were furious and argued that the prevention of artificial colouring in food and beverages would be an infringement on freedom, claiming that people should be allowed to drink aniline coloured wine if they wish to. In a second report, Girard claimed that using chemistry to defeat adulteration would help French trade and honest companies by thwarting the attempts of fraudulent producers and traders to boost their profits by deceiving the public. Girard and fellow chemist Paul Brodel argued that chemists should be the final arbiters of food safety. Food producers and retailers, however, argued that chemists alone should not be allowed to define the quality of food and drink, especially wine, and secured the help of other chemists, such as Paul Cazeneuve, to demonstrate that most aniline and azo dyes were no more harmless than vegetable-based dyes. For many years, food producers failed to acknowledge that chemical colorings were being added to food and drink, partly because they did not know, 
or chose not to investigate what the dyes they were using were made from. Dyes were sold by third parties with innocuous names such as butter yellow, primrose yellow, chocolate brown, citrus orange, and the extent to which food manufacturers were aware of the nature of the dyes being used as food colourings was made very clear in their responses in 1901 to a parliamentary select committee set up by the British government to investigate the use of chemical additives in food. When Robert McCracken, managing director of United Creameries Limited, was asked if he knew what aniline colour his dairy used in the manufacture of butter and margarine, he replied, I really do not know what the actual article is. His answers provide a revealing insight into the ignorance of the food manufacturers about the dyes they were using and the lack of transparency throughout the supply chain. When asked, you do not know what they are called, he answered, no, I find that there has been aniline colouring in one of the butter colours which we used, but the quantity is so small that it would practically do no harm. And where did you get these aniline colouring matters from? They're mostly from continental manufacturers. You do not know the chemical names of them or the trade names of them? No. Nor anything about them? No, we buy them as butter colouring and we get them in a solution in oil just as we get an Arto, which was a widely used plant dye at the time. Is there a declaration on the bottles of all those different colouring matters as to what they consist of? No. Mr McCracken's responses demonstrated substantial trust in the suppliers of dyes, as well as a lack of concern on the part of the food manufacturers about the actual substances used. When asked if some of the aniline dyes really are most noxious substances, Mr. McCracken answered simply, they may be. The food industry during the last decades of the 19th century was in the midst of an industrial transformation. As millions of people moved into cities to work, the need to store and transport food increased. So chemicals able to preserve, color and flavor food became increasingly used in food production. Chemists played an important role in the transformation of the food sector, both in devising new foods and production and preservation techniques, and in the creation of expert systems of food surveillance. As food firms sought to consolidate their position in the marketplace, they increasingly turned to chemists and chemistry in the food supply to in, and to endorse food products to prevent for fraudulent adulteration or contamination, to standardise processes and to endorse food products as pure and hygienic. Chemists and chemical preservatives and colourings became part of the armoury employed by large food companies in their drive to secure market share and to ensure their products were seen as trustworthy, reliable, consistent, unadulterated and of good value. Letters between the York-based chocolate manufacturer Roundtree, who I'm sure many of us are familiar with, um, and various chemical analysts, including Arthur Hill Hassel, illustrate the reciprocal and self-serving nature of the relationship between industrial food producers and chemists. The letters demonstrate how food companies and chemists work together to legitimize the use of synthetic chemicals in food as preservatives and colorings, but also to improve food production and marketing. For example, in one exchange, the chocolate company stated that it was prepared to pay for an analytical report on its chocolate product, provided that the results could be used for advertising purposes, going so far as to suggest that Hassel alter the wording if necessary, in order to promote the product better. Here we see in a letter from 1888 from Roundtree to Hassel. Dear sir, the price you name, 15 pounds, 15 shillings is high, but we would not demur to the amount for a report of a chocolate so worded at, so as to be useful for publication. 
We do not, of course, ask in any way to anticipate the results of your inquiry, and we have absolute confidence in everything we put forth on behalf of elect COCO. Still, it is possible for an, an improving report to be so worded as to be of but little use for trade purposes, and we therefore should like to inquire whether details of wording, if not contrary to the results of your inquiry, could be modified in accordance to our suggestions without extra charge? Hassel obviously was prepared to go along with this request as two days later Roundtree wrote, Dear Sir, we are in receipt of yours yesterday and thank you for the satisfactory answer to our query. Enclosed, please find check. As we are just commencing an advertising campaign up in the north, we shall be very glad to have your report as soon as possible. A particular area where food manufacturers sought the help of chemists was in the law courts. This is an arena where the position of the chemist was especially tricky. Chemists appeared as expert witnesses in food adulteration cases, both for the prosecution and defence, depending on who was paying their fee at the time. Like expert witnesses today, the same chemist might appear one month on behalf of the local authority prosecuting someone for selling food allegedly adulterated with aniline dye, while the following month appear in a similar case arguing for the defence that the use of aniline dyes was perfectly legitimate. An example of such practice occurred in Birmingham's Victoria Courts in 1900 when a grocer named Thomas Davis was charged with selling dyed sugar beet crystals as Demerara sugar. Appearing for the prosecution were leading chemical analysts Alfred Hill, public analyst for Birmingham Council and a former president of the Society of Public Analysts, the SPA, Charles Castle, public analyst for Kensington, Lincoln and High Wycombe, and Alfred Allen, Henry Allen, public analyst for Yorkshire. The grocer's defence team meanwhile, also comprised three leading chemical analysts, two of whom, Bernard Dyer and Otto Hainer, were also presidents of the SPA during their careers, as well as Benjamin Newlands, a consulting chemist who worked with sugar companies such as Tate and Lyle. Hainer, who was public analyst for West Sussex, the Isle of Wight, Derby and Nottinghamshire, claimed in the court that dyeing sugar in the West Indies was normal practice and that he considered the aniline dye used to be harmless to health. Hainer noted that a dye was used in the preparation of nearly every article in food and in the case of sugar the object of dyeing was to make the sugar an even colour and pleasing to the eye and in accordance to the public taste. Hainer's comments in this case are particularly interesting as they give no indication of his antipathy to artificial food colouring. In fact, they contradict his comments in private discussions among other analysts and in the sanitary press where he spoke out critically about the dangers and deceptions of chemical preservatives and colourings in food. By the end of his career, Hainer was thoroughly disenchanted with the industrialization and manipulation of food, with the addition of chemical preservatives and colorings. In 1923, he would even be removed from a Ministry of Health departmental committee on preservatives after writing a letter to the Times expressing his forthright opinions on this very issue. Hainer's comments in court, however, demonstrate the capacity of consulting chemists to adapt their professional opinions to meet the criteria of their clients, whatever their views. Indeed, conflicting evidence presented by chemists in court had already become the subject of much controversy during this period, with expressions such as liars, great liars, and scientific witnesses often used. Chemists such as Hainer were paid to be consultants to businesses as well as public authorities and appeared as both witnesses for the prosecution and defence in court. Analysts expressed different views on the dyes in different settings, views that altered with their conflicting roles as public and political advisers, food custodians, 
scientific researchers and commercial consultants. Chemists appeared as experts in courts, advisors to government committees, consultants to companies and commentators in the media in order to make a living and to ensure that science and scientists played an active role in social and political decision making. Thank you. Unfair. Okay. okay, thank you. Silence from everyone. That was, that was super, somewhat disturbing about the sort of food we um, uh, we uh, consume. Um, well, while I wait for the questions to come in, um, perhaps I can ask, use my chairman's pocket and ask the um, uh, first um, question, and that is about the sort of general idea of using chemicals such as anilines um, and their sort of ideological status as a sort of benefit of science. I mean, I mean, there's a sort of, I get the impression of the sort of view that sort of the knowledge that science produces cannot, uh, in the 19th century, anyway, uh, cannot do um, harm, must be beneficial for people. Um, and I just wonder whether that's the sort of element of thinking behind everybody's sort of pouring anilin dyes. Um, uh, into food, and I'm mean, sort of it's, there's a sort of seems to be a similar phenomenon of radioactivity at the end of the 19th century. That sort of radioactivity is a natural phenomenon, and therefore uh, does no harm. It, it, it's it, it's sort of different in the sense that the the aniline dyes were never intended to go into food. So so the, it was only after sort of a few decades that they'd been put into food that people realized they were going into food so there was never a concerted these are great materials to go into food um, because they're going to be safer than lead or whatever it was more much more of a case of uh, the dyes went into the marketplace for textiles and the dye companies worked really closely with the textile companies and showed them how to use it and everything but they didn't they weren't really conscious that they were ending up in food. So because the supply chain became quite long and, and, and the food manufacturers would buy their dyes from dye suppliers who had previously given them sort of plant essences and things, um, it, it was more a case of by the time the unintended consequence of the dyes was discovered, it was more a question of justifying their use. Um, and there were, there were so many vested interests because the consumers had got used to sort of much more uniform coloured food and the producers had got used to using these dyes and they were you know, in many cases much more effective than the old traditional dyes. Um, it was a case of justifying their use and, and you're right, um, you know, the things scientists were producing consciously at the time were considered fantastic inventions. So had the stories not surfaced about people getting rashes, there probably would have been no concern about their use, if you see what I mean. No. Okay, so questions are coming in. Um, first one from Ernst Hombrick, at least I assume it's Hombrick, it says Ernst. Um, Charles Gillard was a chemist too, even a discoverer of dyes. Yes, he was. So not all chemists did legitimise the use of dyes in foodstuffs. Not quite no. sure whether a comment or a question. No, no, Ernst is quite right. Um, because Charles Girard founded La F or ran up, um, La Fusine, which was one of the big French dye companies, and he was very sceptical about the use. So, so the and and same with Hainer, actually Otto Hainer, or, although he acted um, defended the use in in court case, some court cases. He uh, some of the chemists were very sceptical about their use in in food. Um, so, and is spot on. Ernst adds, but it had already happened with arsenic pigments. See Jost Martins. Let me see the chat. It had already happened. Sorry, what's the question? Maybe I can explain the question, Karen. Oh, oh hello. Yeah. Uh, so the because you were referring to plant materials so that they saw the aniline dyes on the market to, and added to foodstuff. But there was already a whole history of poisonous uh, inorganic pigments in foodstuffs. 
Yeah. And so if you look from that perspective, and that was very, there was a strong discussion on that in France uh, in the 70s and 80s, 1870s, 1880s. So uh, Charles Girard was, of course, in his office as a medical and chemical advisor of the Paris uh, municipality. Yeah. In that. So uh, for him, of course, the aniline dyes were just... Uh, yeah, something wrong of this of the same stuff as yeah. was happening with the inorganic stuff. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. You're quite right. I mean, it, 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 there's a huge long history of of artificial coloring of food, probably since food was first produced by man, as it were. Um, and 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 the, a big issue was not so much whether the these dyes were any more or less toxic than previous dyes used. It was the the issue of the fact they were being used to deceive the public. So whether they were plant dyes or uh, aniline dyes, that the issue of deception was was still the same. So yeah, I mean, Girard was looking into all sorts of dyes as well as the aniline dyes, you're quite right. Okay, next question is from Joris Michaelis, which I hope I pronounced that more or less correctly. Um, to what extent and in what ways were discussions about the use of dyes in food different from discussions about the use of other chemicals as food additives, preservatives, etc.? Were the dynamics different between the synthetic dye industry um, and was that seen as in, was that was, sorry sorry were the dynamics different because the synthetic dye industry was seen as an important industry? Um. So the dynamics between different chemicals used in food or or, 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 or more natural, whatever that means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think as Ernst has elaborated and described, it, the issue was, the, the issue pr primarily was deceiving the public. So, um, so if, if we're looking, if you're comparing aniline dyes with, plant dyes then in many ways they were both considered as deceptive um if you're looking at the, the different dynamics between chemical colorings and chemical preservatives um they were they were often very similar um but it's just that the coloring ones were sort of first on the scene and recognized as such Okay, that, that leads ni very nicely, I think, into Gerald and Robert's um, uh, question about when, when did the use of aniline dyes in food become subject to legislation? Okay, um, this, th this varied from country to country and the type of legislation varied as well. So France and Germany and some other continental European countries were the first countries to actually... Um, ban some aniline and azo dyes that they perceived to be poisonous um, and so and, and you're talking probably in Germany 1887 and a few were banned um, so in the 1880s mainly across Europe I think a few maybe in the 70s um, uh, in Britain there were no prescriptive legislation banning specific dyes. In, in Britain it was just against the law to use materials that were used to either deceive the public or poison the public. So that's why it, you had to prove in court that the dye you were using was used in that way. Um, and in America, they in the US um, America, um, the it was the 1906 Pure Food Act, and they went, took a very different approach to the Europeans. Instead of banning um, dyes that they knew to be poisonous or thought to be poisonous, they basically banned all dyes apart from seven that they deemed not to be poisonous. Um, but there was no consistency among chemists as to which dyes were poisonous and which weren't poison were harmless basically and and it was very hard for them to actually prove either way so, i mean that's presumably a reflection of the sort of different legal traditions in different, yeah, different countries exactly. yeah partly yeah and and food legislation was fairly 
new in that sense anyway so yeah um so a couple of questions from joshua zintel uh how much does specific argument of the definition of food purity in inverted commas take place as in a compound has defined purity until adulteration but with the advent of new additives these changing parameters had to be fought out right question mark yes i mean <laughs> proving what was pure and what was not pure um, and what was natural and what was not natural um, was a question of, of authority in the, in the marketplace and, and mediation between the producers, the consumers, the legislators, the chemists. Um, so for example, I'm, in chocolate, uh, to remove some of the bitter taste, some chocolate companies were adding in potash and claiming that actually that was a much purer way of um, than putting in flour to, to take the uh, uh, bitterness out. So, you know, who determined what was pure and what was not pure and what, what was a legitimate additive and what wasn't was totally a matter of mediation. Uh, and it, may, it would be now, I guess. Yes, I mean, his, and his second, second part of his question was, uh, thus, how much of a bottom line came down to the semiotic theory of purity? Yeah. I mean, it, it, yes, what is pure? So, you know, if, if you go back to the slide I had with all the food companies advertising their stuff as pure, in many sense, they would have been putting chemicals in, but they, that might have been seen as making the um the, the product more hygienic and scientific and therefore purer i mean one one so another question that actually occurred to me um was you mentioned some you mentioned in the course of your 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 talk um about the public taste uh of foods um so presumably somewhere along the line I remember uh, somebody eating a food or buying food has some sort of platonic ideal of a food when they sort of, when they go along the sort of um, shelf. And I mean, Ernst Ernst sort of brought, brought, sent a sort of uh, follow up question about sort of butter colouring. Was that for, was that for margarine? So I mean, margarine would if, it, if margarine was sort of dark green, would that be as as um, attractive as a margarine that's all be deliberately colored to look, look like look like butter no um, yeah well marg margarine is very interesting because of course margarine mainly i mean it depends what you make margarine with but in that that era it would have mainly been white and it, they used to color it yellow so it looked like butter um and therefore was deemed to be more palatable even if it was sold as margarine and not butter although i suspect in many cases it would have been sold as butter even though it was margarine um but that created a huge outcry from the butter manufacturers who demanded that consumers were being deceived and buying a much cheaper product um disguised as butter so in in lots of countries um they introduced legislation so either you couldn't put yellow dye into margarine or in the case of Canada and Australia um, and I think in some state particular states in America they were made to um, put pink dye into margarine so it was, you know there was no way the consumer could be confused between margarine and butter so which tells you that at, by that stage actually the concern was not so much the toxicity of the dye because you wouldn't be making them put pink dye in more rather than the deception of the public that was the bigger concern but i mean what's what's the public actually you remember the public and you go and buy something if you you mentioned specifically sugar being coated in something to make it look 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 exactly the same i so the, presumably the manufacturers have some idea what the public actually want well i i i the 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 thing with the sugar was um that demo initially the sugar from the caribbean um was quite brown 
um, and the high quality sugar was deemed to be white, a bit like the debate we always have with white or brown bread and that goes through the ages and sort of turns around. Um, and then in Europe, they started processing sugar from sugar beet and that was very white. And then the brown sugar from the Caribbean, which had, be, had been very unfashionable if it was brown like Demerara became fashionable again because it was perceived to be more authentic so then you got food companies dyeing the white beet sugar brown in order to make it look like the now more popular demerara sugar so th so so what the public likes isn't is is a changeable thing if you see what i mean yeah, 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 so yeah. in many ways they were, were responding to that i mean i'm i'm quite surprised by the the butter one so in in the butter one where one of the analysts said the, the consumer likes his butter her butter to be the same all year round is interesting because if you were having butter straight from the farm it would change color during the year because of what the cows were eating so in today's market we'd sort of you, you'd have thought that could be marketed as being authentic if your butter was changing color because it shows it wasn't being tampered with but but in the sort of late 19th century with the industrialization of food consistency and it is still the same now you know consist consistency of standardization of food was considered to be a mark of you know quality okay uh so ernst has had a follow-up question so um why was colouring added in the first place? Why w in capital letters in Ernst's case? <laughs> Why? Okay, um, all sorts of reasons. So, for example, if you take canned tinned peas, um, well, anybody who anybody who um, bot bottles or preserves apples and vegetables know that actually most of the time they end up being a sludgy brown. Um, so. It, it would have been to make them look far more attractive and fresher you know if you're opening your can and they're the peas are green still then um they're going to be more appetizing so there was there was that aspect there was also um a degree of adulteration going on in the marketplace which had become you know was a, as people moved into the city and became far more distant from the where their supply of food, the provenance of their food, and where their food originated from, there were plenty of people in wholesalers and retailers in the supply chain who might just water down the milk that was coming from the farm and add a bit of yellow in so it didn't look quite so watered down, just to increase their profits a bit. So there was that aspect going on, um, and you know, I, people have coloured. I people coloured their food throughout history to make it look more appetising, nicer. Okay, um, so a question from Leslie Steinitz. Uh, to what extent was this a British phenomenon and related to low status and salaries of the public and analysts? Do you know how different the situation was in France and Germany? Uh, it was pretty similar. Um, it, it was it was it was pretty similar across Europe and um, in the States. I mean, I think they were more. I suspect the earlier period of my time, so the from the eighteen fifties on, there were a, maybe a few more big uh, industrial food companies in the U in Britain um, then, um, but. I don't think it changed much and it and it was it was in products like margarine uh, that was used across I mean obviously it originated in France margarine but it was used across Europe and in America where it was it was dyed yellow everywhere so there was a lot of consistency. Okay and a follow-up question from Vivian Quirk. Um, so was there, was there something distinctive about deceiving the public through food compared to other consumables? Uh, well, I suppose for most people, food was their biggest expenditure and the most and the thing they most consumed. And, and you literally consumed it. So, you know, you ate it and it became part of you. So I suspect that was, you know, pretty material. 
and it you know because if you're deceiving people by watering products down you are actually changing the nutritional value I mean, I know we all pay a premium now for skimmed milk, but you certainly wouldn't have expected to have paid a premium for skimmed milk in the 19th century. Right. Um, not sure I'd like to eat food in the 19th century. <laughs> no, well, I, I have to say, I suspect the um, preservative in effect of the aniline and azo dyes killed a lot of, off a lot of the bacteria that probably would oh. give you far more stomach aches than the dyes themselves, but there you go. Okay, right. A uh, question from Hassock. Um, how were the public analysts positioned in relation to academic chemists on the one hand and industrial chemists on the other hand? Oh, there, that's a very interesting question. Um, so the public, the public analysts um, spent most of their time in the 19th century complaining that they weren't given the sort of status that the academic chemists were. Um, and or the um, or the monetary um, compensation that the industrial chemists were. Um, so if you look in the writings of the and the meetings of the public analysts, they were constantly moaning that they were underpaid, underappreciated. Um, so that, that there was definitely a different sort of status level between them. And a question from, well, a follow-up from Robert uh, Bud. So was the anxiety about colouring a reflection of anxiety about the number of new, inverted commas, foods and newly sourced foods? H.G. Wells's War in the Air begins with a greengrocer's concern about the uncontrolled multiplication of imported fruits. Uh, okay, I... I, I, I that's interesting. I wouldn't have necessarily said it was fruits, but but there was a huge concern about imported food. Um, and if you read the comments made in each domestic, um, each country's own domestic, you know, news reports and, and journals and things, it was always the foreigners' um, food that was more highly coloured and, and artificial than your own food, if you know what I mean. Whether you're in France, it was the German food and the British food that was awful and, and full of dyes. And if you were in Britain, it was the French food. So there was definitely a lot of um, xenophobic food fears going on. Um, and it was partly to protect the, you know, your own, the domestic supply producers wanted to protect their own markets. And a question from Rob. Um, when were public an analysts first appointed? And oh, okay, in legislation in 19, oh, sorry, 1872 was the first legislation that effectively allowed for the appointment of public analysts. And it was a slow process. I mean, lots of places didn't have a public analyst. And as, as some you may have picked up from the talk, uh, you know, Otto Hainer was public analyst for West Sussex and the Isle of Wight on the south coast, as well as uh, Nottinghamshire in the Midlands and Derby, I think. So they covered a lot of ground. Well, that presumably reflects their, their poor pay. So did they? Exactly. Yeah. They did have a, they did yeah. have a point, but they weren't being paid particularly well. So they had yeah. to have free jobs. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, I seem to run out of questions. Um, so if anyone's got more questions, uh, I've got one. The last one. I mean, you met, you talked a kind of bit about BASF, um, which after was based in the Grand Duchy of Baden, and of course one associates Robert Bunsen um, with Baden, sort of the great German chemist. And I didn't hear Bunsen's name once, which did slightly surprise me, considering the BAS, BASF link. Oh, okay. He's definitely in my book. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah he's, he's definitely in the book. But th there are a lot of chemists involved, whether it's in sort of in the industrial bit or in the... Uh, um, in, in I was talking mainly about the chemists that the food companies and the chemical companies were being asked to... Um, and, and so I focus probably more on the public analysts than the industrial chemists. Okay, so I think we've come to a natural stop. 
Thank you so much, Caroline. That was really, really interesting. And I hope you've uh, you will increase the uh, uh, sales of your book as a consequence. And one thing I should have mentioned in the, um, in the introduction uh, is that your book is being translated into Chinese. Um, I know, that's so exciting. And I think we had some Chinese colleagues. Uh, they weren't on screen, but I think they may have been sort of um, listening. Or at least I hope they were listening because Zoom, Zoom seems to be allowed in China in the way that Teams isn't allowed in China. So all, right. all of them. All very strange. Um, I reassure them by saying I'm not translating it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's the worrying thing: is how do you know how do you know what the book says? <laughs> no, I know <laughs> that is pretty interesting. Yeah. So it just remains for me to um, uh, to remind everybody that the uh, next seminar in the series will be on the 12th of January when Joe Hedison will be uh, talking. Uh, details of that will be circulated in December and early uh, early January. Um, and then just to thank everybody who was responsible for running the uh, um, webinar this evening. That's sort of uh, Rob Johnson. Um, Anna, Anna Simmons, uh, Becky Martin, um, and Caroline would have not been involved, but uh, she was performing so as a speaker, uh, so we sort of let her, let her off this, <laughs> this time. And Becky Martin, of course. Um, so thank you, Caroline for, Caroline, for a really, really super seminar, and I look forward to reading your, reading your book. So thank you. Thank good night, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Well, we hope you found that of interest. If you'd like to know more about the topic, Caroline's new book is now available in most bookshops. It's called A Rainbow Palette, and it looks like that. And now a note for your diary. The next Shack online talk will be given on Tuesday, the 12th of January, 2021, starting at about 5 p.m. GMT. It will be given by Dr. Joe Hedison, and the subject of the talk is the promise of an alchemical panacea, Francis Anthony and his potable gold. We hope you can join us then.